dear colleagues, you see uh, how interesting trials are conducted to lower the world. My floor is, and floor is given to Professor Christopher Lin, who will tell us about modern concept, concept of glaucoma progression. And he participated in this trial. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much, Natalia. And I, I really apologize that I am not able to attend the meeting personally because the current situation in Hong Kong is really bad. I mean, Hong Kong is now under intense pressure. And our campus, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, actually um, has become um, with protesters uh, confront the police. So, um, and, and there are many roadblocks in the city. So um, it, it's a very difficult time for me to travel. Um, I hope uh, you will enjoy my presentation, although it's um, going to be delivered um, online, but I, I, I hope you would um, understand what I'm going to share with you about the um, concepts, the current concepts of detecting glaucoma progression with OCT. We have um, a number of OCT devices and we also have many parameters that we can measure from OCT. Sometimes many of us actually get very confused about which parameter to measure in the monitoring of glaucoma. We can measure the retinal nerve fiber layer, we can measure the GCIPL or Gengen cell in the plaques form layer, and we can also measure the neuretinurine. I don't know how many of these parameters you will measure uh, in your clinic, and, and sometimes it, it is difficult, um, not only because we have many parameters uh, um, that can be measured, but also because there are so many different types of OCT, and then the technology of OCT also keep advancing over the years, so making the situation pretty complicated. In the um, World Glaucoma Association um, consensus meeting in 2016, we have a group of uh, glaucoma specialists from around the world to discuss about how to diagnose glaucoma. And here is one of the consensus statements uh, we uh, arrived at the meeting, which state um, clinical diagnosis of glaucoma is predicated on the detection of a thin retinal nerve fiber layer and narrow neural retinal rim. So to diagnose glaucoma, we need to measure two parameters the retinal nerve fiber layer and the neural retinal rim. Now with OCT, uh, we have um, the opportunity to measure objectively the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and the neural retinal rim dimension. We have been actually been using um, retinal nerve fiber layer measurements to diagnose and monitor glaucoma for a long time. And that's why in the literature, in the literature, we have more data uh, coming from retinal nerve fiber layer measurements for monitoring of glaucoma compared with new retinal rim measurements. So in this talk, I would be focusing more on using the retinal nerve fiber layer um, for monitoring of glaucoma. Now, in terms of diagnosis, we know measurements of both retinal nerve fiber layer and new retinal rim is important because all kinds of optic neuropathies, glaucomatous and also non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy, they all show loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. They all have degeneration of retinal ganglion cells. In order to define glaucoma, that's why we also need to measure and evaluate the new retinal rim. The loss of the new retinal rim is a relatively specific biomarker to diagnose glaucoma, whereas 
the rectilinear nerve fiber layer is a relatively more sensitive biomarker to detect glaucoma and also other kinds of optic neuropathies. So um, the first question we have here is why do we need OCT measurements to monitor glaucoma progression? Here I have an example to demonstrate to you. We have a glaucoma patient uh, being followed for over seven years from 2007 and 2017, uh, from 2007 to 2014 in this example. And all along um, these years of follow-up, the intraocular pressure actually was pretty normal. They are all below 21 millimeter mercury. When we study the visual view, uh, it actually takes seven years for this eye grass. But when we look at the retinal nerve fiber layer measurements, here we are looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness maps collected every four months over the seven years of follow-up. And what we are looking at here is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness map. Uh, with increasing intensity of red representing thicker nerve fiber layer. And with OCT analysis, we are able to see that progressive retinal nerve fiber layer here detected by TPA or trend based progression analysis, it takes place almost four years before we see visual field progression. TPA is an algorithm that we developed here in Hong Kong. It performs pixel by pixel retinal nerve fiber thickness analysis, and it shows in addition to where progressive retinal nerve fiber layer thinning occurs, but also shows how fast is the retinal nerve fiber layer is thinning over time. Here in this example, progressive retinal nerve fiber layer thinning was first detected in 2010. And in fact, when you look at TPA progression, uh, it actually allows change acted earlier than GPA. GPA stands for a guided progression analysis which is an event-based analysis, which is available here in the um, CalSize device uh, series OCT. Here, see the time gap is 24 months. Sorry for the typo here. So with TPA or a trend-based progression analysis of retinal nerve fiber layer, we are able to detect change of the retinal nerve fiber layer 24 months earlier and event analysis of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. TPA um, detection of retinal nerve fiber layer thinning uh, is detected before GPA detected progressive retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. And they are both detected before we see visual field progression. So this example demonstrates to us that the use of TPP and GPA for analysis of retinal nerve fiber layer thinning allows us to detect glaucoma progression much earlier compared with visual view uh, progression. Imagine if we can intervene at a time when we see change of the retinal nerve fiber layer wouldn't it be possible then for us to prevent future loss of tissue field? So that's why it is critical to measure retinal nerve fiber layer thinning over time. It is critical to measure structural change of the optic nerve pad over time when we evaluate patients with glaucoma progression. And here in this study, uh, we validated the performance of TPA and GPA. What it shows here in this study is that uh, when we see change of the retinal nerve fiber layer, when we see progressive retinal nerve fiber layer, 
thinning detected by TPA, these eyes have actually a more than a fold increase in risk of development of visual field progression. And not only we demonstrated that it is important to use retinal neurofibrillator layer to monitor glaucoma progression. We also um, have demonstrated it is important to measure and monitor the GCIPL of the macula when we evaluate glaucoma progression. The GCIPL represents the cell body and the dendrites of retinal ganglion cells. And we are interested to measure the GCIPL of the macula because the macula has the highest density of the retinal ganglion cells. We measure the retinal nerve fiber layer over the power papillary region or regions adjacent to the optic nerve head. We measure retinal nerve fiber layer over the power papillary area because all the retinal ganglion cells, they send their axons towards the optic nerve head. And that's why the retinal nerve fiber layer is thickest over the power papillary region. In this example, um, it shows in some cases, progressive GCIPL thinning of the macula can be detected before progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning over the optic nerve head region. And in this case example, it's about two years time gap between the two changes. However, in some cases, we see the opposite. Here, we see progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning precedes the progressive GCIPL thinning by almost three years. So why sometimes we see progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning first and why sometimes we see progressive GCIPL thinning uh, first? It is very much related to the, to the scan protocol we use to measure GCIPL thickness. Uh, in the series of CT, it measures the GCIPL over an elliptical annulus over the macula. Imagine uh, if there is a retinal nerve fiber defects developing right at this region. Using GCIPL can actually detect sometimes changes earlier than power papillary retinal nerve fiber layer. Why? It is because retinal nerve fiber defects are almost always wedge shaped. And we have an expanding defects developing from the optic nerve head towards the macula. So with a wider defects developing over the macula, it is more likely that we're able to detect thinning of the GCIPL of the macula compared with the power papillary retinal nerve fiber layer. Because when you get closer to the optic nerve head, the defect size is also getting smaller. But when we have a defects developing outside this elliptical annulus, we would then not be able to detect thinning of the GCIPL of the macula. In this scenario, progressive retinal nerve fiber layer thinning over the, uh, the power papillary region would be able to detect change. So that's why uh, in this example, we demonstrate technically we need to use both, both the retinal nerve fiber layer over the power papillary region and the GCIPL over the macula in order to maximize the probability to detect change. The biological reason for using both GCIPL and our, our NFL to evaluate glaucoma progression is based on the fact that we see retinal ganglion cell degenerations. Sometimes 
we can detect genetic loss before axonal loss. Here is a mouse eye. Uh, we have a device to image the retinal ganglion cell axon and then dries longitudinally over time. After optic nerve injury in this retinal ganglion cell, we see dendritic loss before we see loss of the axon. Here is another retinal ganglion cells. Again, after the same form of optic nerve injury, we crushed optic nerve, we induced um, optic nerve injury, and in this example, we see loss of the axon. We see shortening of the axon, fragmentation of the axon, before we see um, loss of the dendrites. So sometimes we see dendritic loss first, sometimes we see axonal loss first in retinal ganglion cell degeneration, and this is why it is important. We need to image the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell in the plex form layer to maximize the probability for detecting progression events. Here we have a model. We have studies demonstrating that progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning of the macula is predictive of future progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning over the parapapillary region and vice versa. Importantly, what we show in our studies is that they are both predictive of future loss of the visual field. So the next question that we ask is, since retinal nerve fiber layer and GCIPL, they are both important, we also know that macular imaging and power papillary uh, area imaging is important. We asked whether the analysis of the combined RNFL and GCIPL over a wide view would actually amend, improve the detection of glaucoma progression. Uh, for wide field imaging, what I showed earlier in the examples, uh, is based on the size instrument, uh, the serial CT, which image the optic nerve head six by six millimeter, macular six by six millimeter. So we need two different scans uh, to take images from both areas. But with the swap saucer CT uh, here, the tritonal CT, because it has a very fast scan speed. Uh, over uh, with a scan speed of 100,000 scans per second, we're able to capture a wide view, 12 by nine millimeter in few seconds. So uh, this is an advantage of the swept saucer CT, which allows us to capture uh, the macular and the power papillary region using the same scan. And other advantage of the swept saucer CT is that we can see the lamina and the retinal nerve fiber layer in high resolution in good signal to noise ratio in the same scan. This is actually quite different from the spectral domain OCT where the signal to noise ratio generally declines with the scan depth. What it means is that we, when we image retinal nerve fiber layer, when we want to get good resolution of the retinal nerve fiber layer, we are not able to get good resolution of the lamina because of the drop in signal to noise ratio. That's why the spectral OCT, a spectral domain OCT, they introduced the DDI or the enhanced depth imaging to allow the um, measurements and imaging of the choroid and the lamina. And so when you use EDI, although you can see the lamina and the choroid, you can't see the retinal nerve fiber layer very well. But with the swept saucer CT, uh, the signal to noise ratio generally is more stable, a long in depth. And that's why you see the retinal nerve fiber layer and the choroid and the lamina in high resolution in, within the same scan. So this is an other advantage why swept saucer CT uh, uh, it's useful. 
uh, we perform a study, this are unpublished data. Uh, we perform a three year prospective study to ask, to investigate whether progressive retinal nerve fibrillar GCIPL thinning a combined uh, measurements of our NFL and GCIPL detected by OCT would be a better approach compared with when we just study the individual layer alone. So we have almost 240 glaucoma patients. They will follow every four months for at least three years. We use OCT, um, the triton OCT, the image eye, and we use also the visual field to measure um, visual field progression. Here is a summary of the analysis. What we see here is very interesting because when we use when we use the combined our NFL and GCIPL, we are actually be able to detect more eyes with progressive um, thinning of the our NFL and GCIPL compared with when we just use the IL, our NFL alone or the GCIPL alone. So this is a, a Venn diagram demonstrating that we were able to detect 55 more eyes with progressive retinal nerve fibrillar GCIPL thinning compared with just the progressive RNFL thinning and progressive GCIPL thinning. And in the survival plot, you can also see eyes with progressive RNFL and GCIPL thinning. They show a worse survival probability compared with the progressive retinal nerve compared with eyes with progressive RNFL or GCIPL thinning alone. Here is an example to demonstrate the point. Um, not only we are able to see more eyes uh, detected with progressive RNFL GCIPL thinning, also when we use progressive retinal nerve fibrillar GCIPL thinning, we are able to detect change earlier compared with progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning, compared with progressive GCIPL thinning. So I highlighted here an example to demonstrate that we are able to detect change earlier. And then here is another example, again, demonstrating the same phenomenon. When we use progressive retinal nerve fiber layer GCIPL thinning, um, as a biomarker to detect glaucoma progression, we are able to detect change earlier than when you when we you when just use our NFL or GCIPL. What is interesting here is that as I mentioned earlier, TP also provides us an indicator of how fast the retinal nerve fiber layer or GCIPL is thinning over time. In this example, you see visual field progression. But in the first example I showed to you, um, here is the rate of change of our NFL GCIPL thinning maps with increasing intensity of red representing a faster rate of thinning. And in this example, you see a beautiful, inferior, accurate defects. This is progressive thinning over the, over the inferior accurate funnels. And when you study the second example, you see a higher intensity of red. Again, we see an inferior accurate funnels. So this explains why this eye also developed visual field progression, because this eye has a faster rate of thinning. Now, it doesn't mean that in the previous example, uh, this eye would not develop visual field progression. We just didn't have visual field progression developed within this three year follow up period. As I mentioned, eyes with progressive retinal nerve fibrillar GCIPL thinning, these eyes are at a high risk of future loss of the visual field. But just to compare these two cases, what you can see, what you can understand here is that when you have 
a faster rate of loss of thin here measured by TPA, this eye would also have a higher risk of development of tissue field loss. So to summarize, integrating the macula and the power papillary region is important. So that's why wide view imaging is relevant in the assessment of glaucoma progression. Not only integrating the macula and the power papillary region is important, but integrating the LNFL and GCIPL is also important because what we show in our study is that when you're able to combine both layers, you're able to detect more change and you are also able to detect change earlier compared with when you just use either layer alone. Most important, what I show in these studies, in these examples, is that progressive retinal nerve fiber thinning, progressive GCIPL thinning, and progressive ILNFL GCIPL thinning, they are all predictive of future loss of visual field progression. So in clinical management of glaucoma, we need to evaluate structural change. We need to evaluate retinal nerve fiber and GCIPL loss because this change can be detected earlier than visual field loss. And if we can intervene at a time when we see progression, we may be able to prevent loss in visual function. Thank you very much. And that's all I want to share with you in this afternoon. Yes, it, it is a very important question. I believe uh, we need to use both the retinal nerve fiber layer and GCIPL for the diagnosis of glaucoma, as well as for monitoring of glaucoma progression. Now we know uh, we can measure the wind width pretty reliably with the um, uh, these, uh, the, the BMO derived minimum wind width measurements that was introduced uh, two, three years ago. And we can also measure this parameter in the clinic. And it is important for us to measure this parameter in the diagnosis of glaucoma, just the, for the reason I mentioned earlier, because uh, wind loss is a relatively specific biomarker for glaucoma. But in terms of monitoring change over time, I, I don't think right now we have um, sufficient data in the literature uh, using OCT to measure wind width to monitor glaucoma progression. So I think we need, still need to wait and see how um, our NFL thinning versus wind loss uh, over time, how would they compare with each other in the monitoring of glaucoma progression. Hello? Okay, thank you.
this this is a great question. Um, in clinical trials, um, very often what we've seen in the literature is that uh, we should feel progression remains to be the um, primary endpoint in many of these clinical trials. But what I believe is OCT measurements, OCT measurements of the RNFL, GCIPL can actually be a better primary outcome measure for evaluation of um, neuroprotective therapies in glaucoma patients, just because we can detect change, we can detect progression much earlier with OCT compared with visual field. So I believe in the future, we are able to see more and more clinical trials using OCT as an endpoint. Although that doesn't mean visual view is not important. I believe visual view is also very important. But the fact that we can use OCT to detect change earlier would allow us to have the ability to conduct the clinical trials in a shorter time with a smaller sample size. Thank you very much for very clear answers, dear Chris. It was a very interesting presentation. It's, it's a pity you couldn't come. And I do hope that in the future we will see you personally, in person. So hope to see you. And thank you very much again.